Hello everyone and thank you for coming to the lecture today. Um, I, it really is a pleasure for me to introduce um, Cecilia Tishy um, to you. Um, she has had an extraordinarily distinguished career and I'm only going to be uh, talking uh, the very, very sort of top level of her, her accomplishments. Uh, you should go online and find out about everything else she's done. But first, she's the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of English at Vanderbilt University. She received her MA from Johns Hopkins University and her PhD from the University of California, Davis. Before coming to Vanderbilt in 18, 1987, Professor Tishy taught at Boston University. At Vanderbilt, she teaches classes in 19th and 20th century American literature focusing on aspects of culture from consumerism and social critique to country music. She's written many books and uh, they include New World, New Earth, Environmental Reform in American Literature from the Puritans through Whitman, uh, another book, Shifting Gears, Technology, Literature, Culture in Modernist America. And another, Electronic Hearth, Creating an American Television Culture. Another, High Culture, oh no, sorry, High Lonesome, The American Culture of Country Music. And um, also, Embodiment of a Nation, Human Form in American Spaces and Exposés and Excess, Muckraking in America, 1900 to 2000. Um, her expose, her book, the one I just mentioned, Exposés and Excesses, Muckraking in America, showed how corrective civic action is inspired by vibrant writers, fact-filled narratives, and expose special interests and governmental damage and dishonesty. So here's an example of literary criticism that does indeed have a political, analytical dimension. Um, and an activist dimension as well. Her newest book, Civic Passions, Seven Who Launch Progressive America and What They Teach Us, tells the story of seven Americans of the Gilded Age, three men and four women, who laid the foundation for human rights in modern democratic America. Professor Tishy shows how these seven, seeking neither fame nor celebrity, shape public opinion and legislation on such critical issues as workplace health, and safety, child labor, public utilities, and the right to be educated at public expense. Brought to life in this book, these seven exemplify leadership in the kinds of crises that demand civic action in 21st century America. In 2009, Professor Tishy was awarded the Hubble Prize. The J.B. Hubble Award is given each year to a scholar who has made extraordinary contributions to the study of American literature over the course of a career. Today's lecture is titled, The Tough, The Tender, and The Captain of Industry. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Cecilia Tishy. I thank Wendy Martin. She and I have collaborated uh, recently on a collection of, of short stories, best of times, worst of times, about these times. Let me ask you, how many in the room are uh, concentrators in the field of literary study? Okay. Uh, how about the social sciences? Good, all right. Anyone from the so-called hard sciences? I was curious, all right. Just so we think about interpretation, and by the way, I'm rather tethered to this microphone because of the recording device, so I, I am cautioned I need not stray. Um, otherwise, I would join you. Uh, uh, if we were to consult a reading specialist, that person would tell us immediately that there's no such thing as reading, per se. Those who read for extractable data are more frequently in the sciences, social, physical, biological. The humanities, as we learn, requires us to develop techniques of indirect reading. This is very troubling to many students to cross from one to the other. Uh, and it must be taught as a, as a skill, 
No one, I think, is born knowing how to read uh, a, a metaphor and just, uh, this is what we all know, but we need to be reminded. The act of interpretation is what often defines humanity. Science, scientists looking at data sets, trying to puzzle out what's important, what's not, what's peripheral, what's major. Uh, for those of us in the humanities, as, as Professor Martin has just, just uh, made clear, there are shifting popular um, uh, trends that must necessarily displace others. And if in your career you're not ready to be displaced, don't go there. There comes a point, just file this, when you will need to learn from people younger than you and be revitalized, therefore. When Professor Martin and I began our work, we were both new critical readers. Had we stayed there, we would both be, first, antediluvian, and second, uh, bereft of resources that are so revitalizing over the years. So I have asked you obviously for today to spend time reading a rather long novel by Jack London, The Sea Wolf, a bestseller from the year 1904. It very quickly sold half a million copies in cloth uh, and at a time when the U.S. population was roughly uh, 75 to 85 million persons. London estimated that he reached, by way of, of uh, stories and his books borrowed, lent, lying around, uh, upwards of 3% of the U.S. population. He was the most popular writer in the United States in his time, meaning from about 1898 to his death in 1916. Participating in that two decade era in which leading intellectuals strived, strove if you like, to shift public attitudes and make an impact on public policy from the Gilded Age to what we call the Progressive Era. Let's position London today. He has dropped out of the graduate and undergraduate syllabus largely because he has been thought in a feminist era to be hyper-masculinist. He has dropped as well because at a time when racial theory was commonplace, he's considered to be racist. You will find, we will find, the N-word in his Tales of the South Seas. Fortunately, all along, year after year, there have been scholars devoted to his work, identifying him with the movements of realism, of naturalism, of modernism, and most recently, Professor Jean Reisman of the University of Texas at San Antonio has writ a, written a book, published it, called Jack London's Racial Lives, in which she shows definitively, with data, that London's ideas of race changed over his career. And you can find this in his books. So if we ask, is the moment ripe for some kind of resurgence of interpretation of Jack London, I would say that we have an opportunity, using London today as the model, an opportunity uh, to move toward one more relationship of the writer, the literary writer, to the culture. You just ask questions that drew responses familiar to us. There's feminism, there's philosophy, uh, there's psychoanalysis, there's racial theory. All these become quite familiar. I hope they're just they're familiar to you. Uh, and as Arnold Ramper said, giving a lecture, the late, I believe he's no longer living, uh, a lecture over the last few years at my university, asked by a graduate student, how do we do our own thing? Professor Rampish said, then of, of Stanford, said, first you must enter into the conversations that are occurring at the time of your graduate study. You enter fully into them, and from them you find your way to something new. London, Jack London, 
It's one of the writers who, perhaps like Kipling, uh, is thought to be a, a teller of adventure tales, seafaring tales. He's been a photographer, an adventurer in the Klondike, and so on and so on. I want to suggest one other possible, and this is London as model, but let me emphasize, I'm really talking uh, about the example he might set, and that is the writer of fiction and poetry, perhaps, as public intellectual. The writer as public intellectual. What might this mean? That this is an effort through fiction and some nonfiction and from poetry to shape public opinion in political, even ideological ways with an end project of the development of public policy all toward a refashioning of the world for a better common life for many more people. Why don't we already understand writers to be public intellectuals? The phrase Dickensian is so familiar that we don't even have to have read Dickens to know what it means. So who were our American, and who are our American perhaps, public intellectual writers, and why haven't they been outed or presented as public intellectuals? I want to suggest that those in the disciplines best qualified for this sort of work have refused to do it, and I mean historians and people in political science. Why is that? because literature has not been regarded as a suitable database for their work. We have a few exceptions that prove the rule. Historians will cite Upton Sinclair's The Jungle for having moved the Congress toward the passage of the 1906 Federal Food and Beverage Act which required inspection, and to this day is, a, is still on the books, inspection of meat, uh, of beverages, and of medicines that cross state lines. That bill had been clogged up in Congress for 17 years uh, because of the pressure of the meat packers, uh, the beverage industry, they didn't want it. Uh, but meanwhile, there was, there was on the part of, of uh, local groups, deep concern about contamination of food and beverages and of toxic medicines. After all, Louisa May Alcott uh, taking, taking mercury-laced um, uh, medicine for her ills became, uh, uh, it became poison. So the jungle pushed Congress to act. Theodore Roosevelt, then president, sent two inspectors to Chicago to see whether Upton Sinclair's novel was just a, a sort of cartoon. And the inspectors telegraphed Roosevelt saying things are worse than the novel presents. And so Roosevelt and Congress finally passed that vote. So the jungle is held up as an important uh, a piece of fiction uh, that has that's changed American history. So has the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know this. Um, uh, Professor Larry Reynolds has a new book um, uh, on that very topic: How Uncle Tom's Cabin Changed American History. And in this political season. We're hearing uh, that vice presidential nominee on the Republican ticket, uh, Paul Ryan, was deeply influenced by Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, uh, as was Alan Greenspan uh, in his youth, former Federal Reserve uh, Chair, uh, who became a kind of oracle in his time. Uh, so these novels, you may not like one or another of them, but historians will say, yes, these are novels that have triggered changes in public policy uh, and are important and we should know about them. Uh, at the same time, they are the exceptions that seem to prove the rule. What has been the public that's sort of the guidance about fiction in the United States. Um, the Puritan minister, Increase Mather, 
fearful that fiction would lead his parishioners away from established doctrine called fiction vain romances which a foolish creature chooseth to misspend his time in reading. Swat. Moving into the late 18th century, Jefferson, in a letter to Nathaniel Burwell, called fiction, in, among many other things, quote, a mass of trash. In the late 19th century then, a time when, as, as Professor Martin reminds us, the disciplines narrowed themselves, when sociology, political science, uh, and, uh, and economics, which were one, became three. In that period, as the social sciences developed, uh, historians went with science, political studies of government became political science and they wanted to detach from those who wrote stories for entertainment. So we have a great divide that's over a century old. We now then have an opportunity because the term public intellectual is so prevalent now because scholars from Richard Posner to Cornell West uh, are regularly termed public intellectuals. We have the opportunity to look at literary figures and see them in a new light. The reason this is new in America um, uh, and, and is not elsewhere is simply obvious if we look abroad. Notice Umberto Eco, um, a scholar, a writer of fiction, and a diplomat serving in the Italian government. Um, you find other figures uh, who regularly write fiction, write literary criticism, and serve in the diplomatic service of their nations throughout Latin America, throughout Europe. Vlacek Havel, uh, a playwright, and he becomes the president of the nation. Is it conceivable in this country that a novelist could become the president? Maybe in your lifetime. All right, so we're in a kind of parochial bind because of particularities of our history. But we can get out of that bind, I think, now. Uh, we need also to, to take note uh, that, that uh, the public intellectual traditionally has an affiliation with a think tank or a university or perhaps a prominent journal. Also true in Jack London's time. The writer who is not so affiliated, you have to make a case for that person. There's a fine line between, on the one hand, celebrity, and on the other, public intellectual. There's a line between dilettante and knowledgeable figure whose narratives deserve our attention because they encode socio-political truths that we need to recognize. Now, what I would like to do is sort of take us through, before we get to the sea wolf, uh, to take us through a, a series of, of PowerPoint images of London's, London's life. Here he is, a young man in his early 20s, please notice the soft collar and that tie that looks more like a scarf. At a time when, gentlemen, you would have worn a starched collar detachable from your shirt, um, long cuffs, uh, that collar would have looked not like his, but stiff, and you would have had a cravat, very carefully tied and well defined. London's look in sportswear, we'll call it today, defines him as, as a bohemian. Um, not someone who's careless about dress, but someone making a, making a statement. I am not of the bourgeoisie. I may have friends there, and he did. He consorted. He's a very genial guy. Uh, but in his very choice of wardrobe, He's telling us that he's 
off to the side from that class. So, here he is as a little boy. Everyone starts somewhere. Um, he's born in 1876. Um, we see how hand uh, colored by a studio portraitist um, that image is. I need to tell you that he was very poor. This is his stepfather. Jack London did not know that London was not his father until he was 21. He did not know that he was the bastard son of a, an astrologer who fled when the woman he had impregnated refused to abort. He sold the household furnishings uh, and and skipped out. His name was William Cheney. Jack London was baptized or, or as, uh, uh, as John Griffin Cheney. Within six months, his mother, who I'll show us in a moment, had married this man, John London, a semi-disabled Civil War veteran. His lungs had been damaged very seriously uh, in firefights, all that, um, those clouds of, uh, of, of gunpowder had uh, permanently scarred his lungs. He had been in Iowa uh, an expert grower of prized vegetables, and he came west, he had three children, he himself was widowed. Within six months of meeting Flora Wellman, uh, they married and combined their families of his two children by then because his little boy had died. And we're seeing him late in his life at about 1897. That star on his chest uh, is that of a night watchman. That was his final last job. He hardly earned any money. He farmed uh, up and down the peninsula often foreclosed, the family moved all the time. Uh, uh, one ramshackle Oakland um, house after another, uh, and, and it was tough. There's Flora, Jack London, and he became Jack uh, by his own choice in grade school. He found his mother to be cold and rigid. She did two terrific things for him. She had come from a well-to-do Ohio family. She split off from her family because she too was interested in astrology and seances. She earned some of her living conducting seances in the San Francisco area and teaching elocution lessons. Um, by marrying John London, she became respectable again. When he left her pregnant with no furniture, she shot herself. Whether it was a serious suicide attempt or not is not known. It turned out to be a flesh wound. The birth was difficult uh, and, and her physician advised her to find a, a, uh, a wet nurse for the baby. Jack London was nursed by a former slave named Virginia Prentice. I don't have a photograph of her. She looks very warm. There is a photograph and she's cuddling him. Um, she not only nursed him through his infancy, but provided the warmth to him that Flora, uh, he felt, denied him. Uh, all his life, Jack London supported that black former slave. Uh, making sure that her needs were met, that she had a place to live, enough money for food, clothing, and meeting all her expenses. Um, Flora did, I said, two wonderful things for Jack. She taught him to read early, and when he had almost no chance of becoming a professional writer and had an opportunity to become a postal employee, a letter carrier. He had taken the civil service test. He passed it. There was an opening. She said, take a chance on your writing. 
let's take the chance. The basis of her backing him is that he had entered a writing contest sponsored by the San Francisco Morning Call newspaper. Um, so many words, an adventure, and he beat out two Stanford students and won. He wrote a description of a typhoon off the islands of Japan that he had experienced as a young seaman in his teens at age 17. She kept him awake with coffee while he wrote it. She insisted that he enter it, that he write it. And he did, and he won, $25. The average pay for a worker working 12 or 14 hours a day at the time was about 10 or $11 a week. Here came this 25. That was the lottery ticket for his future, and she backed him. Just so we wouldn't see only his head as a little boy. This is a studio photograph. Chances are those are not his clothes. A studio photographer would keep, would keep uh, clothing on hand uh, so that anyone who didn't have highly respectable clothing uh, wherever they lived could put on essentially a costume for the, for the photograph. That is Jack London's dog, Rollo. Um, at the time, there is no evidence to suggest that he was going to, to feature dogs in his fiction in the future. Uh, but it's a, a charming photograph in some ways. We can see the facial features already. Um, that backdrop is, uh, is a, uh, uh, no doubt, a, 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 a painted flat uh, because that is a studio photograph. Flora and, and John would have had to, to um, pony up to get that photograph made. Uh, we can see from it that his mother and his stepfather had ideas about respectability, about literacy about doing things right in society. I'm taking us back here to the year Jack London was born, 1876, and we are in Philadelphia. We hear a lot about the 1892-3 um, Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Uh, if you've read Devil in the White City, that's that fair. This is the one that commemorates the centennial of the Declaration of Independence. We're in Philadelphia here. Ten million people visited this fairgrounds. The country was three years into a dreadful depression. So these people were not affected by the depression. Um, uh, and it was a huge statement about the United States of America now on the world stage in a time of empire, as, uh, as Professor Hobsbawm has told us, the age of empire, all the great European countries with their far-flung empires, and the United States ramping up for its own empire. Um, uh, we've sometimes been asked to think that our empire was first internal as we uh, pushed back and, um, and uh, through various genocidal acts cleared the land of the native uh, populations in this country. But here is the U.S. getting ready for, for its, uh, its moment on the world stage. This is the icon of that fair, the Corliss engine. The reason I'm bringing these, these the three images of the 1876 Centennial Fair is to, is to position Jack London's birth with the world into which he was born. One of expansion, uh, one of manufacturing acumen and, and achievement, uh, this, this uh, Corliss engine produced 2,500 horsepower and it powered various engines and lighting systems at the fair. It was started in a ceremony presided over by 
President of Brazil, Don Pedro, and President Grant. They threw the switch, the wheels started to go, and you see the, the uh, uh, ratio of uh, human size to the size of it. I saw one of these in northern Michigan. Uh, it was uh, in use for a copper mine, for refining copper. A question to ask is, what powers this engine at the other end? And the answer is somebody shoveling coal. Manual labor at the very back end. None of that labor is visible here, nor in the previous image of people gathering, the great crowds, men in swallowtail coats and bowler hats, women in bustles and floor length, uh, uh, handmade dresses. Forty yards of, of material would be nothing. You selected your own accessories and uh, trimmings. Fur, beads, jewels, your dressmaker made them for you, and of course your tailor. And who's making those things? Who's back there sewing, sewing the fur onto the collar, cutting the cloth, lining the coat, shoveling the coal? Here we're still at the fair, we're in the interior. In those glass cases, new consumer items, crystal, Steinway pianos, books, lighting fixtures, every conceivable kind of consumer item. It's now a wealth and abundance of consumerism as of 1876. Ohio had some of the most advanced exhibits. They were a leading manufacturing state, think Cleveland. California, a grapevine, a barrel of wine, and a very poor boy who would grow up to be famous. It would not have been possible for Flora or John to make the trip east. They couldn't possibly have afforded it, not even on the cheapest Pullman car. So who's making all these wonderful devices? Here are the, here are the figures, sort of the founding figures of this Gilded Age, not all of them, sometimes called the moguls, the titans. We've had recently um, uh, an amazing spate of very lengthy biographies of some of these guys. There's Carnegie. Some thought he looked a little like Santa Claus, Saint Nicholas, with his little beard. David Nassau has written, uh, just in the last few years, a, a very hefty biography. There's John D. Rockefeller, uh, upper left. Uh, he also, Ron Chernow, um, uh, writing in a, a you know doorstop size biographies uh, uh, and and re how should I put this Matthew Josephson in the 30s called them robber barons the newest term is Titan um, and it seems to go with our own Gilded Age, uh, a rethinking of the importance of these figures in defining America, sort of Steve Jobs's of their time. Uh, and then we have, uh, uh, I think it's uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, founder of my own university, without whose help I would not, I don't know where I'd be. Um, there he is. Notice that, that, that tie, that stiff, um, starched collar. If we ask who's doing the starching? Who makes that possible? Um, and there's Junius uh, J.P. Morgan who in 1901 suckered Carnegie into selling Carnegie Steel. Congregated Carnegie Steel two or three other steel works, a bridge company, and it became U.S. Steel. Um, so there they are, the titans, um, the great figures, and I think Chernow also uh, uh, has done the biography, the new one of, uh, of Morgan. Uh, I'm blocking the name of the guy who's, who's, who's just recently done the, the Vanderbilt biography, but you see my point. These, these uh, the titans, the moguls, no longer, no longer 
the robber barons. I want to suggest the script in some ways for Jack London's life. Flora is helping, but Jack had also done this kind of work. This is Lewis Hines, well known, you've seen it uh, perhaps elsewhere. It's a very uh, often reproduced image. It's called Breaker Boys. Uh, these are the kids, boys. Uh, their their uh, their noses and mouths uh, are sooty because they're breathing so close to coal that's being poured down chutes. Their job was to pluck out the rocks, the stones, uh, so that only the pure coal chunks uh, proceed to um, to to whatever um, fireboxes they await them. Uh, Hein uh, became very interested in child labor and he took an enormous number of photographs. The Library of Congress has a lot of them. Jack London himself did the kind of things that boys often did in the past to earn a few cents. He was a paper boy. He beat somebody's rugs. It was before people had vacuum cleaners. You'd, you'd throw a rug, a carpet over a clothesline, and then there were they looked like tennis rackets, and you'd go whacking at the, and you just basically beat the dust out of the rug. Maybe that would be worth a quarter, something like that. Um, he helped a, an ice man deliver blocks of ice. He set pins in a bowling alley. Those were the kinds of, of boy chore work tasks that were thought to build character. But he had other jobs as a young guy, and I want to connect them to this sort of look. He worked in a jute mill for 10 cents an hour in Oakland. The mill was one of the leading manufacturers in Oakland in the closing decades of the 19th century. And once the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, I think, uh, was in force, you couldn't get, if you were a manufacturer of jute, you could no longer get cheap, um, cheap Chinese labor. So you turned to who was around, poor boys, like Jack London, who had gone through elementary school, maybe middle school, not high school. 10 cents an hour for shifts that ran as long as the boss said they needed to run, but at least 12 hours. He once worked 36 hours straight. And it was a matter of eating or not eating. He wrote about it later in a story for a mass market magazine, and the story is called The Apostate. He was asked to write a story for the magazine, and the editor thought maybe child labor would be a good topic. People were becoming interested. People were thinking, the public, maybe kids shouldn't be doing this. Maybe they should be in school. Maybe there should be another way. Here, too. This is a, uh, a Lewis Hine photograph. This is a child in a North Carolina textile mill. Um, same thing. Very little schooling, off to work, long hours. The reason that the uh, employers liked children is that the fingers, the little fingers were nimble and could uh, work around the looms. Of course, there was no safety, no safety equipment, no regulations for safety. Maiming, dismemberment were often uh, the case. Jack London worked as well in a cannery and he saw, he saw fingers um, in the blink of an eye gone. Um, he saw the scars from the knives, um, and it scarred him. So when he, when he fled the jute mill, he became, for a fairly short time, uh, 
the term is ho-boy, H-O-E, boy, and it's the long form of hobo. And these were day laborers. And if you didn't go around with a farm implement, and the, by the way, the railroad, uh, Southern and Central Pacific Railroad mogul, um, Collis Huntington, when uh, the subject of a, of a hoe boy came up to him, he said, that young man should be happy he has a hoe. There's capital there. That's his capital. He can earn a living. Don't talk to me about, about uh, difficult lives. So, so I have this image just to, just to show uh, riding the rails. It was extremely dangerous. Jack London did it. Enough of these, enough of the jute mill, enough of the cannery, um, uh, enough of the steam laundry. He'd worked in a steam laundry. Um, if you ask who starched Cornelius Vanderbilt's collars, he did. Um, in the hot California temperatures such as those we have right now, where you feel you could just pass out. The starch vats, scalding to your hands, to plunge in. How could he then translate some of that experience to a public that needed to know what was going on behind the coreless engine? behind all those consumer products. Um, what devastation for the lives being lived out of sight. When the gold rush in Alaska came up in 1896, London jumped at the opportunity. Bear in mind, California was full of stories of the 49ers. Sutter's Mills, all that, veins of gold, now Alaska. If you can stand it, you might strike it rich. Um, more lottery tickets. He went with a, uh, with, uh, uh, his, his brother-in-law who was in his 60s and should never have done it. The brother-in-law turned back. Jack spent a hell of a winter of 1897 in the gold fields. All the scholars say one thing about that experience. He found no actual gold, but he found the gold that he milled and mined for the rest of his career. The stories he heard around the campfires with the Inuits, the gold hunters, the old sourdoughs and the newcomers, the dogs, the freezing sub-zero temperatures, the sleds, um, the ambitions, the murders, all of it became, became his capital. And when his mother said, try to write, that's what he finally was able to do. And this is his breakout book. This is the cover of the, of the first edition, Call of the Wild. By then, this is, this is 1903, and he had been writing for <coughs> almost five years, selling a little, not quite enough, sell some more. The two stories that broke through and gave him serious recognition appeared in one high-toned West Coast magazine, the Overland Monthly, and on the East Coast, the Atlantic Monthly. And they were stories of Alaska, of the exotic life there. Bear in mind that recreational reading often ran to the National Geographic of the time. People were interested, sitting in their parlors, being comfortable, um, having their clothes starched and made for them by other people, um, nice and comfy, in upholstered furniture, reading about the exotic lives of the other. See those dogs? If you reread Call of the Wild, how many of you have read it ever? Okay, you know, story of freedom, right? Um, uh, of, uh, of a search for self, of identity, of, of uh, rite of passage. But if you think about those dogs as industrial workers, harnessed in, driven every day, beaten, never fed enough, 
so that they had to catch food from one another. So everyone that was full was at the cost of one that wasn't full. If you reread it that way, you might see the emergence of the public intellectual who's trying indirectly, not hammering the audience, entertaining and teaching at the same time, always keeping in mind the need to entertain, to find the publisher who would agree, to find the audience who would welcome the name of Jack London. And this was the breakout book. Within a short time, it had sold 1.7 million copies. Bear in mind, the population is about 90 million in the country. Who read him? Workers like to read him. Literate workers who had some time, draymen, metal workers, stable hands, military men. If you do some research at the Huntington Library and the Jack London Collection, you find orders uh, from the Navy, from the Army. 20 copies for one base, 40 copies for another base. Um, but also, he was reaching the new class of bourgeois professionals and managers. Hotel managers, dentists, insurance agents, women who joined their garden clubs, church groups, synagogues, people who were living respectable lives in the new suburbs, outside those nasty, dirty cities. They were retreating, as Theodore Dreiser said, to little islands of prosperity, but they were intrigued by what was going on elsewhere and wanting to break out of the Victorian straight, straightened ways of thinking. He appealed, Jack London did, to that group and it's very important that he do so. I'm getting to the sea wolf. Hang on. Um, very important. He's married by now. Uh, I don't have a, a, an image of his first wife. It was a, an unfortunate marriage. He had two daughters um, by her, Bess. He always supported them. He always supported his mother and, and of course his nanny, always. Um, this is Charmian Kittredge, London. Uh, they are married. If you go to Jack London State Park, and fortunately the state parks are still open, uh, you'll see where they lived and you'll see his farm, his actual acreage. So life is good. Life is good. This is the photograph I want to point out. Uh, it was um, taken uh, from the Alaska, with the Alaskan kind of image. It's a fur collar, leather, leather jacket. And in 1985, he was enough of, a, of an American iconic figure that he got a um, postage stamp. It's interesting to think who is first denounced uh, for, for threatened, uh, threatening to ruin society and later lauded uh, with a stamp. Uh, when Jack London published some of his work, his work, some of his socialist essays because he was politically a socialist. The owner and publisher of the Los Angeles Times, uh, Otis Chandler, inveighed against him as a destroyer of all good order, a wrecker who would ruin society. Chandler stepped in to edit, edit a piece that his own reporter had done on London. Now London gets a postage stamp. Time moves on. I simply want to show that, that he was a sailor. And he knew the ropes, the lines, um, because in the Sea Wolf, uh, it's important that, that the nautical terms and acts be accurate. Let me mention that at Vanderbilt University, I included this novel a couple of years ago and asked undergraduates uh, to make presentations. Two or three of the guys thought, how could a rogue wave really be that? That's just fiction. They did the research. They, they were able to document the events that take place in the novel. Now obviously every event was not, 
was not um, researched, uh, but they did not find fiction. They found representations of actuality at sea. Uh, this is London's yacht, Snark. He sailed to Hawaii, he sailed to the South Seas, uh, became terribly ill, had to sell the boat and stop the voyage that was intended to be around the world. He had shipped out, as I mentioned earlier, at age 17 on a seal hunting schooner up to the Bering Sea, the Sophia Sutherland. Uh, he shipped out as an able-bodied seaman, uh, which is one cut or two above the, the entry level uh, uh, rank. He was always very proud of that. He was a sailor all his life, sailed the uh, waters of the San Francisco Bay, um, and two boats of his own, Spray and Romer. Therefore, he knows his nautical stuff. This is the, the uh, jacket cover of the Sea Wolf hardcover, and I'm going to come into to what I think we need to, to pay attention to. Public intellectual, Jack London, 1904, and we see that's supposed to be Wolf Larsen up there looking very threatening. Uh, and of course, London's name, quite prominent at the bottom. Uh, and one last, ah yes. The captains of industry, I'm sorry they're blurred. Uh, I wanted captains to be on screen because I would like us to take a kind of turn a turn away from The Sea Wolf as a book of nautical adventure, as a love story, uh, as a Nietzschean exploration of philosophy, as a Darwinian um, uh, meditation on evolution, social Darwinism, all of which has been written about on the influences of London uh, in relation to a, uh, a notorious seal hunter from Canada. And consider that at a time when the mentality, the psychology of the robber barons was of interest to U.S. readers this population exists in a state, this is the phrase, of unstable equilibrium where their passions flame like prairie grass. If we think of the only, the only crewman who might ally with Humphrey uh, and Maud is Johnson. All the others are in some basic way impaired, um, conspicuous by their absence are the robust, stable crewmen of the working class who might be shown to combat Larson in an alliance with Van Vyden, with Hump. They appear in other of Jack London's stories and novels. I'm gonna cite, there's a story called The Dream of Debs in which unionized workers basically go on strike and the upper class has to realize that the infrastructure of their lives has disappeared from their morning cream uh, to the oats bags for their livery stables. Uh, another story is, is called South of the Slot, set in San Francisco, and then in a novel called The Valley of the Moon, uh, published in 1912, and the University of California Press has reissued it in, the, in their uh, series on California writers. So, except for one lone stalwart, this is Johnson, readers of The Sea Wolf must look elsewhere in London's fiction and essays to find strong, brainy, working class figures. The Sea Wolf, in The Sea Wolf, London cleared the decks and forecastle of such crewmen. Those decks become instead the stage on which London presents the potential in action for the bourgeoisie, that is, for his middle and upper middle class readers to become major players in the country's necessary revolution. In combat against the captain, it is they and they alone that occupy the main stage in this novel. Nationally, it's the likes of Humphrey Van Vyden, Hump, and Maud Brewster who are charged with constraining and neutralizing the industrial era tyrants. It is they, as the Sea Wolf makes clear, who have the intellectual potential, the social savvy, the cultural capital, 
and the willpower that can and must be summoned for this monumental imperative. Not, of course, in their former lives of cosseted gentility, for they must undergo a rite of passage in life's rough and tumble. The bourgeoisie must thus stiffen their spines and confront the incorrigible, intractable captains of industry. Doing so, the bourgeoisie can be saved from themselves. This was Jack London's message even before he sailed to the North and South Pacific. This was his message, that the bourgeoisie, signified by Hump and Maud, must gather their resources and confront the incorrigible and intractable captains of industry. They must undertake um, the project of social reform. They must get these kids out of the coal mines and out of the, out of the textile mills. Um, they must get the likes of a Jack London out of the jute mill, out of the cannery, for decent wages, for reasonable working conditions, um, for safety um, uh, assurances on machinery that had no hoods. It's for, it's for the Humphreys and the Mods to take a hand and become stakeholders in a world that desperately needs their efforts in reform. And that's where I, I, I'm uh, closing to say we have an example of the novelist who's the public intellectual, who's trying to shape public opinion and trying to do it in ways that will result in better public policies. That vile, denigrated word, regulations, if you like. Um, so through his fiction, and, it, and it's an invitation, I think, to look at the fiction of others and ask to what extent uh, their canons are databases and to factor in along with the sociologists, the political luminaries, so forth, the impact that the writers are having with their own narratives, their own poetry. And so this is, an, it seems to me, an optimal moment to rethink in literary studies the relation of the writer to the public and the writer as an influencer of, of public um, thought and action. So when we look at this period and we see the, the, the major figures, we're not seeing the writers included. It's so interesting. Um, uh, landmark books that historians write. Jackson Lears had just written one, something like The Rebirth of America from the 1870s into the 1920s. London's not even in the index. Um, who else isn't there? Who ought to be there? What case can be made? Um, this is a time, it seems to me, to um, redraw the map uh, in your terms, and you're the ones to do it. Thank you. ask questions to uh, make sure that you get the microphone. I can, I can call, I see, I see a hand, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constrained by my own microphone. I dare not venture forth. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, Hi. I really liked your presentation. Um, so I had a question about the part when the transfer from the boat to Endeavor Island. And kind of, I guess you mentioned in Call to Wild, the dogs, and then obviously the seals play a role here, and the scene with the brutalization of the seals. I yes. I'm just wondering how, if you're suggesting that the intellectual characters of Humphrey and Maud, Maud are supposed to be, I guess, like the new rulers of society or something like that, to free us from the industrial grasp of um, moguls, how yeah. like they're transformation on this island by brutalizing seals plays into that reading? It, 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 that is an, uh, uh, you call attention to a really uh, riveting uh, episode. Um, so interesting that London reserves to this novel that episode because he had been in, in uh, on the Sophia Sutherland, he had had to pound those seals 
uh, 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 at age 17, 18. Uh, uh, in this instance, I think that that giving Wolf Larsen the the critique uh, uh, of of devastation of wildlife uh, on uh, uh, to serve fashion, which which Larson does initially. This is because of what women want. Women want furs, and we go out and kill seals uh, to give them their furs. Uh, I I think that that uh, later in the island, uh, what what London has in mind for Humphrey and Maud uh, is is uh, is survival. Uh, I think there are two things, in other words, two two things in relation to the seals, and a third. The third. Uh, you might remember a moment when when Maud uh, brings up uh, David Starr Jordan's name as someone who's an expert in seal colonies. Jordan was the first president of Stanford University uh, and he and London had a connection uh, that I'm not going to foray into so we can get out and have dinner. Um, but but uh, initially when, when uh, Wolf uh, trivializes the reason for the seal hunt. It makes a lot of money, but it's because of women's whims. I think that's that's an authentic critique on London's part. The work was so dangerous um, uh, for the men. Uh, the 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 bull seals. You know, you can want to tangle with them. Go down to um, go down to La Jolla to uh, the so-called Children's Beach and see if you want to confront uh, one of those seals. You do not. So they're they're not just sweet little you know little like the little stuffed animals. Uh, and uh, and so it's a uh, Larson is given I think an authentic uh, uh, point of critique. Later on, I think that that what London wants us to see is survivalism for those two. But that in itself, now that would be an interesting uh, possible, possible paper topic because you could get all kinds of things in there, that is, uh, issues. Taxidermy, who's doing that and why, and what is trophies, uh, women's fashion, um, uh, who's doing that work, what's the, uh, you know, what's the, um, What's the psychological impact of that work? Um, and if you do that, you want to look at that, at that um, but you come down and see me afterward. There's that, uh, a book about that Canadian seal hunter who was a really notorious rogue, um, uh, much in the news, in the news as, a, you know, as an adventurer. All right. Thanks. I see someone in the, in the balcony. Hi, um, I also really enjoyed your lecture. I had a question about um, your conception of uh, Maud and um, Van Wyden as kind of the bourgeois figures whose job it is to basically overthrow the tyranny of the, the captains of industry. But I'm confused because it seems to me that Maud and um, Van Wyden don't actually do anything like that. In, they, no. they, they escape from the, the ship and then the other thing that happens is that Larson ultimately is just overthrown by his own sickness, right? It's kind of, and it's also, it, it, it's not something that's really something you can ascribe to a certain kind of activity that he does. It's a stroke which seems to come out of nowhere, right? And then also, I wonder if you could also speak to how the book ends as punctuating it very much as it felt like as a romance story. Yes, um, and how that fi fits into your reading of them as uh, yeah, um, the, uh, you know. e excellent questions all. Uh, they need to. I I use the word they need to neutralize him. Um, uh, London, London was on a tightrope of entertainment and and reformist um, uh, messages. When he wrote his straight ahead political. Um, uh, even some fiction, uh, The Dream of Debs, that one about the strike in which the organized workers um, uh, crippled the country's infrastructure. And then we see the savagery of the elites and the savagery of those at the very bottom of society as they, for instance, um, uh, wrangle over a horse carcass because they're starving. 
um, that story bounced from one magazine to the other and finally appeared in a socialist magazine. London had to earn his living. He spent a lot, he earned a lot. He was the first American author to earn a million bucks. When a million was a million, now it's a billion. Um, and and uh, so he had to entertain, he could not abandon that, that personal mandate. When comes that moment, and you remember it, uh, when Humph has a knife and he could stab Larson, he could kill him. I think London could not, for reasons of audience receptivity, um, let him do it. And he had also, for reasons of audience receptivity, to be able to pr have a, a book promoted, the book promoted for its romance as well. So those are the entertainment uh, dimensions, and it's true, they do, um, they soften, I think, that, that, that message. Uh, I can't deny that for a moment. Uh, I think the message, though, is, is still in place that the bourgeoisie need to, uh, need to test out the, the, the moralistic nostrums that they've learned to spout in school, that phrase from Milton, virtue untested is no virtue. Uh, and we have to see uh, London saying, the Humphreys and the Mods, you need to get down and dirty and see what's going on and it'll be good for you and you'll be stronger and you'll be, you'll be prepared no longer to be an enabler of the status quo or, or a, a um, uh, or kind of a, what do I say, uh, I'm looking for a word that suggests that you, you, just, you just cower and wait and, and hope nobody bothers you because um, you've got your trust fund, you have your nice home, um, uh, maybe you have a security service uh, to protect you. Uh, get into it, see what, the, see what the situation is. When you read, for instance, um, uh, the um, former, uh, this is going off, you know, uh, off the train here, but let me do it for just a minute. There's a there was a book, it, it made quite a stir a few years ago, called um, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Um, young guy who worked for Bain, um, Bain Consulting, from which Bain Capital spun off. Uh, and he and the um, dean of the business school, Columbia University, basically say the same thing. Here's what they say. High level management. Here we are in the Drucker School. High level management, but Peter Drucker, Drucker I think would never approve of this. They jet in, uh, let's say to Indonesia. Uh, they land at the airport, they're helicoptered to their hotel. They have their meetings in a high rise suite, the hotel, out of sight of what's going on at the ground. Uh, they take pride, the highest level, of not having to visit these places around the world. Um, the John Perkins, the economic hitman, who had been in the Peace Corps, was invited by some, uh, and he'd gone to, I think, Middlebury College, you know, fine college, uh, and uh, some at, I think, Boston University, my old um, stomping ground. He, he was eyed by, by someone on the, on the staff in the hotel who said, would you like to see what's really going on? Spend an evening with us. Down from the suite in the intercontinental whatever hotel and off into the slums and see what's really going on. And these energies will not stay suppressed forever. And of course we're seeing some of this now, outbreaks, the so-called Arab Spring. That's what I think London, London wants uh, his bourgeois readers to do. Get amongst the crew, see what's going on, see what the cost of this level of autocracy, tyranny is and costs, um, and do something about it. There's a book from about that time, about 1902, called um, our 
Horror by Ghent, G-H-E-N-T, something like our new medievalism. It argues that rather than the vassals of the king, we have the enablers who are the entourage of the, of the, of the captains of industry, right down to the ministry, the professoriate, um, uh, the editors, uh, of, and, and so we could say now the whole media, uh, and and um, and they are the enablers, and they are the courtiers uh, of today. Our new medieval, I think, order. Something that book, something like that. London had it in his library and relied upon it, and and that's exactly what he found. That the official versions, sort of situation we're in now, right now, this afternoon, uh, is a cushioning. Uh, meanwhile, halfway around the world, the Foxconn workers revolted last night um, and were beaten by the security guards. So we can all have our new iPhones. Mm. Um, as a much longer answer than you want. No one will dare put up their hand because <laughs> you'll get a speech out of that woman. Is that, do, do you, you know, I think he just had to pull his punches to sell the books. But he also wanted that message in there. And I think it's in there. I uh, I want to thank you also because uh, thank, I think your reading really uh, clarified uh, what to me were uh, I was uncertain really about what London's position was uh, seemed to me and uh, I don't know if anyone else experienced this maybe I'm confused, but in the beginning I, I felt like Wolf Larsen was almost an admirable character especially in comparison with Humphrey who was, you know, as he said, living off of dead hands or what, you know. Um, but uh, I thought, uh, I agree completely, you know, that the, uh, the kind of middle class has to kind of face the cost of their privilege. And uh, I think that the sealed clubbing is kind of a part of that. Um, yeah. But uh, I was wondering, um, oh, and, and I also thought that, uh, the, the the fact that they don't uh, really overthrow him is sort of a fact of the situation that uh, I think he sort of wrote himself into a corner because uh, you know they they have to take it they're not going to give it up they, you know and so it has to be taken yes. away yes and uh, so I was just wondering what you thought about that but also I thought uh, something else that was kind of interesting to me was. Uh, Wolf as sort of a pathetic character because uh, even though he is cruel and selfish and uh, um, stubborn, he he does read the books, you know, and he does seem interested. Yeah. And and, I, and, and it seemed to me that uh, he was uh, uh, just a sort of a sad character. Yes, and lonely, and and will uh, Humphrey realizes this ab about him you know just to to uh, and and your your observation is especially important as in sort of alerting me to to uh, bring up very briefly one other point london did not want in any way uh, to unwind the achievements of the industrial order what he said was you have found a way to create material bounty for masses of people, and you haven't done it. Uh, and instead, you have been abysmal failures at the distribution of the wealth you yourselves have created. We have to take you out of your system so that your system can be made to work for us. And when asked, you know, are, what about you as a socialist? And uh, regrettably, socialism got lumped with communism and anarchism, anything that ended in ism, um, you know. Uh, uh, and and uh, London said, we're social beings. We want the best social world for all of us, but maximally. Isn't that what we want? Well, let's get on it. Here's what we need to do. So the, uh, Wolf Larsen, and notice that, that uh, London is, uh, uh, endows him with the, the um, invention of a navigation device that really does work, really simplifies navigation. It's going to be an important improvement. Uh, and, and so just as, as, um, 
and how Carnegie um, recognized the value of reinvesting in steel so it would be produced um, with maximal efficiency and strength for, for all sorts of uses, purposes. Uh, so Larson, uh, in these in these regards, uh, a valuable figure, thoughtful. Um, Carnegie wrote a lot, you know, trying to justify his, his world, his activities, society and relation and so on. So it's not to make, to make the Larson some kind of thug, uh, but to say these are figures of high achievement, but they've sort of gone off the rails um, in relation to the, to the people who live in the world they created and work for them. Yeah. Oh, good, a woman. <laughs> Guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then we're all going to. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, we talked about the message for the bourgeois reader that he had. What would you say is his message for his wide worker audience? I mean, the seals don't really yeah, revolt. No. I mean, there's not like a lot of inspiration with those no, seals no, if you no, love that's, yourself. They're not. Them. No, I, don't, I think it's not there. Um, uh, that's a that's a, a really good question because he shows so often the the uh, the the defeat of 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 the workers. Um, he was a member of the Socialist Party. He admired the union effort, the organized, the uh, uh, organized labor. He also saw how organized labor could become its own worst, or one of the worst of its own worst enemies. Uh, if if we look at, uh, I suggest uh, there's a story called South of the Slot. South of the Slot. Not too long. It features a sort of Humphrey. And he's a young professor of economics at Berkeley. And to do kind of field work, he goes down to the to the slums. And he sees he sees unionists, men, women. And he becomes drawn to that world. He likes it. It's real. Uh, they're making headway. They're getting better wages. Uh, and at the end of the story. The Berkeley professor, he's got one name, I remember, and he, and he uses a pseudonym down there when he's doing his field work, and he's fallen for a, a, a woman who's, I think, the head of the glove makers union, uh, and he has a moment when he has to decide who he is, and he goes, he goes to the, to the organ, to the workers, because that's where the vitality is. London himself found that his best intellectual conversations were with non-conventional academics who had been ousted from their positions. There was no tenure at that time. Um, and, and some hobos who were really thoughtful. Some guys like Larson who just did some reading and were thinking about things. Uh, and so the, those figures thread their way through his, through his stories. Um, and, and you can find them. I would suggest um, The Valley of the Moon uh, as a book that really takes up um, uh, the, 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 the workers their power, their authority, and how they can exert it, and how they sometimes fail as well. So I, I was interested in, you know, what you were saying about this novel being kind of like an immediate appeal to his readership. And it reminded me of something that kind of bothered me in the novel, which was London's almost inexplicable back and forth between present tense and past tense. Uh, I was just wondering if you made anything of that, if people, it seemed like, Obvious to me, but uh, maybe it, it's not so obvious. No, it, it, it's just something, I, you know, it kind of got by me. Um, uh, I think that he, I, what, I'll tell you what, I find his descriptions, and he once said that his real skill is elaboration, um, that he struggles with plots. And that might be a, a kind of cue to what bothers you. The plotting, the sequence of, of plot, the arc of the plot, um, he struggles with that. He's great 
when it, yeah, here's a sea storm, let's do it. Um, you know, here's a scene in the galley um, with leech, uh, let's do that. But when he's got to do the shifting, uh, I think the, 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 the old, the, the plot problems um, uh, are there. I guess uh, maybe yeah. I was wondering if it could have been a justification for kind of slipping in the present tense as, hey, this is an immediate thing. It's not just a recollection. He, he does do that. He does do that, and he, and he does it in um, in his his uh, narrative of of um, the cruise of the snark. It's called, and and he was going to call his his sailboat. Um, Gull, G-U-L-L, -L, his poet friend said, Snark, that's terrible, terrible name. Uh, but it's as if, as, as one of the crewmen said, um, that boat was born under a, an, ill, an ill star, you know, a bad star. Uh, and, and he switches into the present tense for, for storms. Suddenly there's a, there's a, a squall. And, um, and, and there we are, the immediacy. I think he wants the immediacy then. Yeah. One last question? Oh. Well, thank you.